The book of Acts was written by the author of the Gospel according to Luke. In many ways, Luke is volume one and Acts is volume two of one story. So hear now from Acts chapter three. Peter and John were going up to the temple at three o'clock in the afternoon, the established prayer time. Meanwhile, a man crippled since birth was being carried in. Every day, people would place him at the temple gate known as the beautiful gate so he could ask for money from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he began to ask them for a gift. Peter and John stared at him and said, look at us. So the man gazed at them, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, I don't have any money. But what I will give you is what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. Then he grasped the man's right hand and raised him up. At once his feet and ankles became strong. And jumping up, he began to walk around. He entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as the same one that used to sit at the temple's beautiful gate asking for money. They were filled with amazement and surprise at what had happened to him. While the healed man clung to Peter and John, all the people rushed toward them at Solomon's porch, completely amazed. Seeing this, Peter addressed the people you Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why are, why are you staring at us as if we made him walk by our own power or piety? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant, Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Living God, we come to lay our lives and the life of our world before your holy word. Speak in power so that we may hear and understand. In faith, believe and act. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Back in October at our church retreat, many of you were at the church retreat, we did an appreciative inquiry process digging into the history and life of First Presbyterian Church. We were asking ourselves, what's the best of First Presbyterian and how has First Pres been its best version of itself over its uh, several last several decades? We didn't go all the way back to 1794, but we maybe went back to 1964. And, and then we said, if we can pull out some themes and topics out of that discussion, can we come up with some areas where we feel like we're really the best version of ourselves? We came up with five areas of, of vision. One is to encounter God in worship. One is to participate with God in mission. To create diverse and inclusive community. To be in caring and deep relationship with one another. And to be lifelong followers of Jesus Christ. So over the next few weeks and month or two, I'm going to talk about each of those in different ways. But today I want to lift up participating with God in mission. What does it mean as a church to participate with God in mission? Both of our stories today touch on that theme. And as I was studying them this week, I just kept pulling out more and more and I thought, man, I could write a book or something, a theology of mission out of these two stories. And that's not what I want to do this morning. So I just want to pull on some threads. And I'd like for you to come along with me and let these two stories act like metaphors for what it means to participate with God in mission. And then maybe down the road we'll write that book together. It was Easter morning, Luke tells us, when the disciples were eating dinner and there had been a God sighting in the neighborhood. Somebody had seen Jesus. It was Cleopas and his friend who were walking down the road to Emmaus and a, a stranger appeared to them. And then they took that stranger home for dinner and turns out the stranger was Jesus. And as soon as they recognized this, Jesus disappeared. Cleopas and his friend ran back to tell the other disciples they had seen Jesus. Just as they are discussing this at the table, 
Who shows up but Jesus? And Jesus says to them what Jesus always says. The risen Jesus always says, peace be with you. Whenever the risen Jesus shows up in the world or in your life, the risen Jesus says, peace be with you. It is the peace of wholeness. The peace of putting the various pieces back together again. It is the peace of God's healing and new creation. That is always what the risen Jesus offers. Sometimes we think if Jesus were to show up, Jesus would have an answer to our deepest questions. Probably not. If you read the Gospels, Jesus didn't give the disciples many answers along the way. Or if Jesus were to show up, there would be a solution to the problem that's keeping us up at night. Maybe not. Sometimes we're afraid that if Jesus were to show up, Jesus would pull out kind of a list and say, okay, Patrick, I've been keeping track of some things. We've got to have a conversation. And it would come with, with maybe judgment. The risen Jesus in Scripture always shows up to bring peace. That's always what is on offer is God's healing. So Jesus says, peace be with you. And the disciples did not receive that peace. Instead, they were terrified and afraid because they thought they were seeing a ghost. So Jesus sets out to prove that he is not a ghost. He says, look, touch me and see. I'm real. Feel my hands. Look at my feet. Usually commentators describe that as putting their fingers in the scars and realizing that Jesus had been crucified. But Luke actually doesn't say that. I think in, Jesus, in Luke, Jesus is just trying to prove that he's not a ghost. And in antiquity, there were some tests to see if you were uh, not a ghost. So if you ever need to prove that you're not a ghost, take a few notes here. Here, here's, here's the way you do that. Tap on your teeth. You got teeth. You're not a ghost. Eat something. You can eat food. Jesus ate some, some boiled fish. You're not a ghost. Let people touch your hands. Apparently ghosts don't have bones in their hands. So if you got some bones in your hands, you're not a ghost. And look at your feet. If your feet are on the ground, you're not a ghost because everybody knows that ghosts float above the ground, right? So Jesus says, look at my hands and look at my, my feet. I, I'm real. I have blood that's flowing through my veins just like you, and my feet are walking on the ground just like you. Now, stories operate at the level of metaphor. So listen closely to this. Jesus offers them his hands to prove that he's real. You should keep that in mind. It's an important image because in the story that we read from Acts, Peter too offers his hand to the man that he meets outside the gate. Now this story may not be familiar to you because it never shows up in the lectionary. This is one of the most crucial stories in the early experience of the church. It sets in motion everything that happens for at least two or three chapters of Acts, but the story itself never shows up in the lectionary. But we decided to put it in this morning. Peter and John were going to the temple to pray in the afternoon, just as the day was drawing to a close. On the way into the temple, they saw a man who was lame from birth being carried in. His friends carried him in and they placed him at, at what was called the beautiful gate. A lot of scholarly ink has been spilled to try to figure out exactly which gate that was. It doesn't really matter. But it was a strategic location. It was a beautiful gate. It was a main entry into the temple. And this lame man was placed there at the gate to beg every day. So his friends brought him to beg for money. And Peter and John saw him being carried in, and he saw them as they were walking into worship, and he asked them for money. As Peter and John stood there, the first thing they did was look at him intently. Some translations say they fixed their gaze on him. 
You know how difficult it is to make eye contact when you pass a person on the street who asks you for money. Surely you have had that experience like I have. Immediately your defenses go up, your heart races a little bit faster, your feet might move a little bit quicker. You put out a hand to say, not, not today. In your mind, you may assign a label or, or a name to the person. I say, that, that person is, is, is riffraff, or that person is, is got problems, or that person needs to get a job, or, or maybe that is their job, and, and maybe that person is addicted, and, and they're just looking for, for money to use or something. To do what Peter and John did, even in that very first thing, to fix their gaze on the man, is really remarkable. I think it's part of being converted by Jesus. It's part of having your, your heart turned over by Jesus. It's to be able to think differently about the people you pass on the street. To get past how they're dressed or how they look or how they smell. To see in that person the face of one who is made in the image of God. That is the motivating, the beating heart of mission. To see the image of God in the other person. The beating heart of mission is not to somehow rescue them from hell and get them into heaven. God does that work. The beating heart of mission is to love them like God loves them because they're made in God's image. And being able to see that is a real conversion. When they had looked at him, Peter and John said, look at us. The man was not looking up at them. He almost certainly was looking down at the ground. That's, that's not surprising. When you spend a life begging for help, eye contact doesn't come easy. I don't know if you've ever been in a place in your life where you had to ask for someone's help, especially to ask for their money. When you were out of options, it's really hard to make eye contact. When you do that day after day and you rely on the charity of others, it takes a toll on your self-confidence and self-esteem. But the man fixed his attention on Peter and John. He did what they asked. He looked back at them. And you know the first thing Peter said? I'm sorry we don't have any money. You and I have given that answer to so many people. I'm sorry I don't have anything on me. And usually you say it with maybe a little bit of guilt or maybe a little bit of awkwardness or maybe you're telling the truth, you actually don't have anything on you and a little glad that you could tell the truth and you didn't have anything on you to give. And you and I have seen the discouragement, the disappointment in, in the face of the person looking back. God gives us the resources to help others. The desire to give, that, that feeling, that impulse, I, I want to give, that's a good and holy thing. That's how God's economy works. God gives some more so that they can help those who have greater need. That's how God's economy works. All we have belongs to God. Even if we work hard to earn it, it's, it's entrusted into our hands to use it wisely and with compassion. But in this story, neither Peter nor John had money. Instead, Peter said, what I do have, I'll give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. And even though it would have been really helpful to that person if Peter and John had given them some money, what Peter and John gave them was even more important. They gave them themselves and they gave them their faith and they gave them their own hope. The greatest gift that you will ever give is the gift of yourself. It is the gift of your own faith and your own hope. Peter and John did not try to extract a confession from the man. They didn't walk him through a plan of salvation. They offered him their faith in Jesus. 
Many times the financial resources that we have to give are very important to those whom we give them to. But just as often, I think, our financial resources blind us and limit our view. Money is always needed. It is always important. It is never the most important gift that we bring. Historically, we as Presbyterians have usually had more financially to give to others than other people have had. We've usually been on the giving end of that, of that economy of, of grace. But the flip side of that is sometimes what it means to participate with God in mission for us as Presbyterians has been reduced to writing checks. Boy, writing checks is important, but it's never the most important thing that you give. The most important gift you always give is the gift of yourself. It's your hand and your heart and then your wad. It's your faith and your hope. So Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. I learned this story as a kid. I don't know if you did. And I read it many times, and then I read commentaries about it. And I always imagined that the, the, the lame man was kind of sitting there, and, and Peter said with this kind of grand preacher voice, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And this, and this guy just kind of got up. That's how I always saw it. And if you read commentaries, that's typically how it's interpreted. The man just, because of, of the power of Jesus' name, the man just got up and walked. But do you know what the story actually says? The story actually says that Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then Peter took him by the right hand and helped him up. Isn't that better? It was Peter's hand and God's hand. It was Peter's help and God's help. It was Peter's power and God's power working together. The man got onto his feet, and while he was getting on his feet, God began to work healing in his body. And those two things went together. The, the peace that Jesus offers the world, the healing that Jesus offers the world, we're never going to get it done in our own strength. But on the other hand, we can't just leave it to God and say, you know, I'll pray for you and keep moving. We pray and then we help. We pray and then we reach down and help. That's how mission works. Participating with God together. Our gifts and God's power When the man got up, he went for the first time in his life into worship. Because he was made whole, he was able to walk, not just walk, dance and leap his way into the temple and praise God. And the people who saw him there said, aren't you the, aren't you the guy that was sitting out there all those years? And he was still clinging to Peter and John they ran to him and, and they were looking at Peter and John like, you must be really some holy and powerful dudes. And Peter and John were quick to deflect that praise. Peter said, that we, we didn't heal this man. God healed this man. This is about what God is doing in Jesus. We just, we just helped him up. Sometimes when we're in mission, it feels really good to take some credit. To say, look at how many people we served. Look at how many people we fed. Look at how many people we helped. Look how much we gave away. And that feels really good to take some credit. But it's never about us. It's never about the credit that we can take. It's about what God's doing. We're, we're just helping. God is healing just helping folks to stand up so that God can work that, that healing in, in their bodies. So how does this work in, in the real world? How does this work when, when people don't suddenly walk after a lifetime of disability? 
Laura Steiner is a social worker and works with kids um, who have disabilities in their families. She studied this text and, and then told her story. She said, I watch daily as parents bring their children with cerebral palsy or autism or other disabilities to our center. And these are families who know what it's like to sit just outside the beautiful gate, to have others pass them by with a glance of pity, to struggle so mightily to see that their beloved children are accepted in the world. They come to our centers ready to try another therapy, another hope for some small progress. Maybe after this session, her muscles will be strong enough to hold her head up. Maybe today will be a day when he calls me mom. But she writes, believe me, all of us know there will be no easy, cheerful leaping, no victorious declarations of praise on most days. Sometimes in a therapy session, a, a four-year-old or a 14-year-old finally stands and takes a step. But instead of leaping next, what usually happens is they lose their balance and tip backward or they, they fall sideways and the therapist or the mom catches them. Then after some laughing or some crying or some worrying, they try again. Laura writes, perhaps in those therapy sessions, we all pray for the leaping to happen sometimes, but mostly when we're at our best, we all just try to really look at each other, offering what we have to each other, risking that with God's help, what we may be doing in the offering is all helping each other to stand up and walk. To show the disciples he was real, Jesus offered his hands and then said, now go be my witnesses. And so we're here and we have this desire to show the world that Jesus is real. We can do it in the same way Jesus did. We can offer our hands to the vulnerable in our community who need help, to the people that we pass on the, on the street coming into worship, to the folks that we see sleeping on the side of a building who, who, who need help. We can offer our hands to our friends who are struggling with children of their own to raise or with, with parents who are, who, are, who are disabled. We can offer our, our hands. In mission, we can offer our hands to a world that needs care. And then, pray that as we help, God will heal. And we will walk and dance together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.